In March 1932, Charlie Chaplin was attending a sumo wrestling event in Japan. Next to him was Takeru Inukai, the son of the Prime Minister. However, Chaplin was supposed to have visited a welcoming party that day, which, luckily for him, he didn't. As during the event, Takeru left for a while and when he returned he looked shocked. In Chaplin's words, I asked him if he were ill. He shook his head, then suddenly covered his face with his hands. My father has just been assassinated, he said. Yet even though Chaplin had just arrived in Japan, he was actually a target of Buddhist assassins. But why would Japanese people try to assassinate Chaplin? To understand this, we need to look into the volatile politics of pre-war Japan and their quite laughable reasons for selecting Chaplin. But first, the Germanic barbarians and their Swabian knot, the Chinese Q-cut, the dreadlocks of the Rastafarians, the top knot of the Samurai, the dyed hair of the Vikings, the Amasunzu of Rwanda, the locks of Alexander the Great, the power of Samson, and the sign of glory among the Dothraki. All men take pride in their hair, and it has shown to the world who they are, and now, thankfully, we can make sure that we keep it thanks to Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that focuses on making it easier and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness. Now I'm going to hazard a guess that most of you watching this will be in your 20s or early 30s, and this is the best time to act, as two out of three of you will experience some form of male pattern baldness before you're 35. And the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. Keeps will send you the treatment to your door, so you can do all of this in the comfort of your own home, but treatments typically take between four to six months to start seeing results, so it's important to act fast. So the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you can save. Plus, throughout it all, you will have constant access to a doctor online to answer any questions or concerns that you might have and to monitor the process. So although you can do the treatment at home, don't assume you'll be alone throughout it all, as you'll have licensed doctors right alongside you. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go on to keeps.com slash jabsy or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Then you can find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention. So go to keeps.com slash jabsy if you want to prevent hair loss today. So Japan had been expanding ever since they opened up in the mid-19th century. They had taken Taiwan, a colony or two in China and the likes. Well, many were calling for further expansion, like the Black Dragon Society, who wanted to take Manchuria and expand into Russia. But there were a number of different groups affiliated with either the army or the navy, who all, in short, wanted to give full power to the emperor and create an authoritarian society and a huge Japanese empire. For a long time though, they were small in number, often focused on forming spy networks abroad and allies in China, the Philippines and other Asian nations. Meanwhile, at home, throughout the early 1920s at least, democracy had begun to grow within the country. Suffrage had been expanded and political parties were formed in a period known as Taisho Democracy, named after the ruling emperor. However, then Emperor Hirohito came to the throne and Taisho Democracy quickly began to crumble. Leftist groups were banned, the military grew in power, and the army launched an invasion of Manchuria, but still the power of the emperor was limited and the politicians were not starting wars in Asia, as many of the ultra-nationalists wanted. So inside the army, soldiers formed the Cherry Blossom Society and launched two failed coups in 1931. Within the navy meanwhile, there was the League of Blood, led by Nisho Inoui. He was already acquainted with other ultra-nationalists, like Sume Okawa, who preached Japan was destined to become the leader of Asia, and this was sometimes justified through Shinto teachings, which argued that the emperor was almost heavenly. But Nisho was actually a Buddhist, and part of a growing number of Buddhists who thought Japan would and should carry out a divine task. For instance, Tanaka Chigaku spoke of their war with Russia decades earlier as divinely inspired to make Japanese citizens aware of their heavenly task. These men, however, were just a couple in a whole host of Buddhists who supported Japanese expansionism and war at large. For instance, there was a Zen priest named Yamada Reirin who said, The loyal, brave, noble and heroic spirits of those officers and men who died shouting, 
may the emperor live for 10,000 years, will be reborn right here in this country. It is only natural that this should occur. I know this point may be a little controversial, so to give you some other teachings, the Zen master Harada Dayun Togaku said, If ordered to march, tramp, tramp or shoot, bang, bang, this is the manifestation of the highest wisdom of enlightenment. The unity of Zen and war extends to the farthest reaches of the holy war now underway. And Sugimoto Goro said, Warriors who sacrificed their lives for the emperor will not die. They will live forever. Truly they should be called gods and Buddhas, for whom there is no life or death. Or going back to their war with the Russians, one Zen master named Shako Soen said, His task was to inspire our valiant soldiers with the ennobling thoughts of the Buddha, so as to enable them to die on the battlefield with confidence that the task in which they are engaged in is great and noble. I wish to convince them that this war is not a mere slaughter of their fellow beings, but that they are combating an evil. And in general, Soen believed that war was an inevitable step toward the realization of enlightenment. Then even D.T. Suzuki, the man who popularized Zen Buddhism in the US, said this around the same time that Japanese soldiers were carrying out the rape of Nanking. The art of swordsmanship distinguishes between the sword that kills and the sword that gives life. For it is really not he but the sword itself that does the killing. He had no desire to harm anybody, but the enemy appears and makes himself a victim. It is though the sword automatically performs its function of justice, which is the function of mercy. The swordsman turns into an artist of the first grade, engaged in producing a work of genuine originality. So many Buddhists taught that sacrifice for the country was noble, and almost the idea of killing wasn't necessarily a bad thing, as the enemy just presents themselves to you and then they're killed. Plus, if you do die, well, you'll be reborn, and you'll therefore not be that surprised to find out that many, in fact most of the kamikaze pilots were Buddhists who thought that they were on a divine mission. Well, going back to the League of Blood, their school of Buddhism was not Zen, it was called Nichirenism. Nichiren was a medieval writer who thought politics and religion were intertwined, and it was the job of a ruler to expand Buddhism. It was also the responsibility of all Buddhists to crack down on anybody who spoke out against Buddhism, and therefore violence was justified. But Nichiren didn't actually like many of the other types of Buddhism, and he said all Nembutsu and Zen temples should be burnt to the ground, and their priests taken to Yui Beach to have their heads cut off. So, in short, nationalism, expansionism, religious extremism, and all the isms were therefore being merged together, and a plot was hatched. Inoue recruited a dozen or so very young officers, and they looked to overthrow the entire elite of Japan through assassinations. Their motto was, one man, one assassination, which meant they believed just a handful of people really needed to be killed for them to bring about this great change. The first couple of people they killed were the finance minister and the director general of the Mitsue Zaibatsu. These financiers were killed in February and March, showing the group in the midst of the Great Depression would have wanted a radically different economic system. Then, in May, Charlie Chaplin arrived in Japan during his round-the-world trip. There was already rumours of political dissent, as the Prime Minister, Unukai, sought for a peaceful resolution in China and didn't want a full-scale war. Chaplin, his brother and one of his friends, a Japanese-American named Kono, went to dinner the evening that they arrived. And there, weirdly, they got into an argument with a local who wanted Chaplin to come to his home and look at some pornographic images. Keep this man in mind for later on. But otherwise he was largely welcomed by the people, as obviously his silent movies transcended international markets because there was no language barrier. The next morning he was invited to a dinner with the Prime Minister, but he preferred to go to the sumo. So the dinner was delayed and the Prime Minister's son attended the event with Chaplin. Yet had the dinner actually went ahead, Chaplin could have been killed, as the event was the target of the attack. But as it had been delayed, the assassins just stormed into the Prime Minister's house and killed him, while others attacked the home of the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal and threw grenades into the Mitsubishi Bank headquarters. This, the May the 15th incident, didn't succeed in bringing about a revolution, and the assassins, most of whom were not even 20 years old, handed themselves into the police. Chaplin then visited the house of the Prime Minister the next day, 
and saw the blood still on the floor. And after this visit, his brother Sidney began to suspect that the man at the restaurant was perhaps part of the plan, and had they taken up the offer to view the images, they would have been killed. But now this brings me on to why would these assassins want to kill Chaplin? Well, during the trials, as Lieutenant Saishi Goga said, Chaplin is a popular figure in the United States and the darling of the capitalist class. We believed killing him would cause a war with America. However, some of you may spot a bit of a problem here. Chaplin was British, not American. And writing about the event years later, Chaplin actually said, I can imagine the assassins having carried out their plan, then discovering that I was not an American but an Englishman. Oh, so sorry. Chaplin nevertheless carried on with his journey in Japan, regularly watching Kabuki theatre, and he seemed quite enthralled by the country. But as he watched theatre, the assassins went on trial, and most of the population began to sympathise with their cause. In fact, the push for war with the United States, as you know, continued to grow, and many Buddhists again saw this as almost a holy war. For instance, after Pearl Harbour, Hakun Yasutani said, Annihilating the treachery of the United States and Britain is the only way to save the one billion people of Asia. Exercising evil spirits from the world and leading to the realization of eternal peace and happiness for all humanity. I believe this is truly the critically important mission to be accomplished by our great Japanese empire. It is impossible to discuss Japanese culture while ignoring Buddhism. We must train and send forth a great number of capable men who will be able to develop and exalt the culture of our imperial land, thereby reverently assisting in the holy enterprise of bringing the eight corners of the world under one roof. So slowly, society became more nationalistic and calls for war grew louder. There were a number of other coups and weirdly, Chaplin was actually present for one more of them. Four years later, he arrived in Japan and witnessed the February 26th incident, but that time at least, he wasn't the target of assassination. 